my name is Stephen Braun. Um, I work here at Northeastern. I work over in the library um, in the Digital Scholarship Group. My full title is Data Analytics and Visualization Specialist, which is sort of a mouthful. Um, essentially what I do is I help students, faculty, and staff on campus who want to integrate some aspect of data analysis or visualization into their scholarship, their teaching, their learning, their research, things like that. So I do a bunch of different things on campus. I do a lot of consultations. So a lot of faculty, students, and staff come into my office. I help them work through problems related to visualization. Maybe that's making a particular kind of chart or graph, or maybe working with a particular kind of tool. So I answer those kinds of questions. Um, I do a bunch of work um, as a designer, as a programmer, as an analyst on a variety of visualization projects and analysis projects. And I also do a fair amount of teaching. So that's through workshops and guest lectures and things like that. So that's why I'm here today. Um, I'm doing sort of a, a guest lecture on what I am framing as communicating scientific data through information design. So we're all here because we do some kind of work with visualization, right? We all work with scientific data. And an essential part of doing research in the sciences is communicating that information effectively, right? So we spend a lot of time, or should be spending a lot of time, thinking about how to best leverage particular design practices to maximize the effectiveness of the way that we're communicating our data. So we're going to spend about the next hour and a half talking through some of the theory behind information design and how we can integrate some of that stuff into data visualization work specifically. And then from about five to six, we'll uh, move into some critique sessions. So we'll actually look at real visualizations um, in the academic literature and have you work through recreating those charting graphs to make them better. Okay. So I want to start out by having us sort of set the stage for the critiques that we're going to do later on. So I, my argument I want to make here is that since we all work with scientific data and we work with visualization, we already have intuitions about what makes a good visualization and what makes a bad visualization. So we're going to spend some time in the last hour during the critiques thinking about what that looks like in practice. So to set that up, I want us to break off into groups of four to five people, okay? Maybe a little smaller, maybe a bit larger if you need to. And in your groups, I want you to find two to three examples of good visualizations, which you think are good visualizations, and two to three bad visualizations in the scientific academic literature. So these could be charts and graphs that are in the papers that you have read recently. They could be um, historical papers. They could be charts or graphs that you've made yourself for your own research. And you think it's fair game. Okay. So go ahead and break up into groups of four to five people. Find four to six examples of visualizations. So what I'm going to have you do is explore these visualizations in your group. And as you look at these visualizations, think about some generalizable design principles that make these good or bad. Right? So think about your intuitions. Is it something about the color choice that makes it good or bad? Is it something about the compositional layout that makes it good or bad? And as you think about these, I have some sticky notes. I know you've used some sticky notes already. Um, I want you to use these yellow sticky notes to indicate some observations you made about what makes a good visualization, and the pink sticky notes to indicate aspects of bad data visualization. So I'll pass these around. I'll give you about 10 minutes, 5 to 10 minutes, to think through these things.
but um, uh, um, but it didn't, doesn't that actually have to do with the
Okay, let's go ahead and talk about some of these things. So, taking a look at what you've written, there are definitely some themes, especially around color. Color choice seems to be either a good or a bad thing, depending on how you employ it. There are lots of comments about labels, so text, text labels, headers, titles, tick marks, comments about axes, right, with us here. Intuitive interpret interpretation, organization, labeled axes. Were there any sort of big ticket things that anyone saw that you thought immediately, oh, this is very good, or this is very bad? I mean, we looked at a mass stack that was annotated where the words were kind of on top of each other, and that's it's actually unreadable. And it seems like a pretty basic thing, right? Yeah. It should be able to read the actual chart graph. Yes. in the literature that are actually designed well. So we're going to spend the next hour or so, hour and a half, talking about some basic principles that we can use to make our visualizations more effective. And that means effective in terms of the ability of other people to interpret it. It means effective in terms of its communication. And it means effective in terms of legibility, right? You want a visualization to be impactful, but not just because it's beautiful, but also because it's actually useful. So we're going to talk about what that looks like across a few different basic design principles that we can employ. So we, we spend a lot of time thinking about data, right, scientific data, and we spend a lot of time thinking about this because we often have to spend a lot of our energy communicating that data, right? And so this is where visualization comes in, right? If we were to think about all the different roles that visual, visualization fills, um, it does that sort of communicative uh, process for us, right? So. We visualize data because it communicates information. That's sort of a baseline foundational thing it does, so that's important. We use visualization to point attention to things. So maybe we have a particular aspect of our data set that we want to highlight and make more readily apparent. But we also use visualization to, to tell a story. And fundamentally, this telling a story act is something that we're always doing, regardless of whether or not we are actively thinking about it. Whenever we could create a visualization, we are creating some kind of story about a data set um, and communicating something about that story. So there are a few different basic kinds of stories that we can tell through visualization. And these stories apply to any kind of charter graph you're making. This could include working with data in the humanities and the, and the social sciences. It could include data working in the natural sciences, right? Whenever we're playing a charter graph, um, we're telling something about that data set. So this is sort of a great um, collection of basic foundational stories that we can tell through visualization. And this is a good baseline for thinking about how we might craft a visualization, right? So if you're working with a data set and you, you want to communicate something specific about it, maybe it falls into one of these five things, right? So we often use visualization to show changes over time in a data set, or interesting factoids, sort of surprising things we might find within the data set, or surprising connections between data points. And the personal experiences, so directly connecting a visualization or what the visualization communicates to the user's personal experience of that data set. 
And then finally, revealing comparisons. So again, these are sort of the, the basic things that we are always doing in some capacity with any visualization. And it's helpful to recognize and be, and be aware of these things because it can help us improve the effectiveness of our charts and graphs. So I want to talk about four primary areas of improvement that we can sort of always be aware of when we're playing charts and graphs. And these are all areas in which we can improve the effectiveness of our chart or graph. So the first thing we'll talk about is composition, so using hierarchy to improve layout and flow for visualization. After that, we'll talk about color, so careful color choice and what that looks like and sort of the implications of that in a variety of settings. Figure clarity, so the legibility of a visualization um, in terms of emphasizing visual and interpretive salience of particular elements in the figure. And then finally, we'll talk about dimensionality and thinking about what it means to work with and communicate multidimensional data, because we're always working with very multidimensional data. And there are simple ways that we can sort of improve the legibility um, and ease of interpreting those charts and graphs that we do create when we're working with high dimensional data. So the, the things I want to talk about um, are sort of basic principles that are derived from the field of information design more generally but applied specifically to the context of working with the kinds of things we might encounter in scientific visualization, working with natural sciences data. So a lot of these examples come from the Nature Points of View articles, which I think you all have been exposed to already in some capacity. So if you haven't, um, you can check this out down here. Um, this is a, a wonderful collection of short articles about basic design principles um, specifically in the context of the kinds of charts and graphs we usually make in the natural sciences, and the biosciences. So for example, thinking about what composition and layout looks like um, for a poster that you might present at a conference. Or thinking about what color choice means for making heat maps. Right? So these kinds of basic things that we, we tend to encounter. So a lot of the examples, again, will come from, from this sort of collection of articles. So if you want to learn more about these things, I will refer you to, to those articles originally. So I'm going to start by talking about composition and hierarchy, because this is sort of the, the foundation from which any good visualization has to start, right? If you think about any charter graph that you've made, one of the first decisions you have to make is how to visually arrange the content in that. So when I say composition, I'm referring to the actual visual arrangements of content within the canvas. So that could include within the area of a chart or a figure on a page in an article, it could include the entire space on a poster that you're presenting at a conference. All these things have to really rely on good organization and good arrangement in order for them to be legible. So one way we can improve the legibility or effectiveness through composition is through hierarchy. And by hierarchy, I mean sort of determining the relative order of prioritization and salience of elements within the area in which you're creating the charter graph. Right, so if you think about any charter graph, where you have multiple elements within that space, where you could have axes, you could have marks, you could have different colors, different channels indicating particular data values. It can be difficult for the user to read and interpret that chart unless you think about the arrangement of those elements as a whole. So this is important because we're often working with multidimensional data in the sciences, right? And so good composition can really aid understanding of very complex information. So there are a few different ways that we can sort of build hierarchy into, into any sort of chart or graph. So the first way is through using a grid structure, right? So this looks familiar to us, right? So for example, in section A up here, we have two examples of different grid structures, and then aligning content within those grid structures to sort of um, increase the, the overall uh, uniformity or consistency of the arrangement of the content. We have two different examples right here. Another way that we can um, enforce hierarchy and emphasize composition in our layouts is making sure that we are following a kind of natural order of contents. So if you think about any poster that you've ever looked at, right, we tend to read left to right, top to bottom. So this is a very basic principle, but we don't always do a very good job of following it, right? So thinking about what is the actual order in which we want the user to read the contents in their figure. So we can be very intentional about that ordering just based on what we know, how humans actually interact with these things. And then a third way of enforcing hierarchy is through white space. So in this example right here, we have two blocks of text. We have this, this bold um, all-caps block right here. 
and then we have this, um, this so it's just separated off section right here, not bold, um, you know, so this in lowercase. And as the example demonstrates right here, right, we tend to find our eyes drawn to bold capital letters, but we can emphasize even this tiny block of text just by giving it empty space. So we can often sort of combine all three of these things using grid structures, um, emphasizing natural organization sequence of material and white space to really improve any chart or graph. So here's an example of what that looks like for a poster. So at, at the top here we have an original poster. This is the original design for this type of poster. Down here we have sort of, actually let me turn the lights down here. Down here we have an assessment showing the relative alignment and spacing of all the contents in that poster. And it's a little haphazard, right? The, the alignment is all right. It could be improved. It kind of looks like there are a bunch of blocks of content floating out in space. And then in part C here, what they've done is they've rearranged that content, all those blocks of content, into a more natural grid-like structure. So giving sort of a, a uniform grid-like structure as well as ample white space around these things uh, to enforce the order in which you might actually read through these blocks of content. So again, these are very basic things, but they can have a really big impact on the way that people interpret and understand the visualizations or figures that we create. So a good guideline for thinking about how to enforce good composition is to think about what are called gestalt laws. So you may have heard about these um, from the, the field of art theory. So gestalt laws are essentially principles of perceptual organization that really define and describe the way that, as humans, we interpret the visual arrangement of things on a page. So there are a bunch of different kinds of laws or principles um, that sort of define gestalt composition, so these ones listed right here. And they all can have some impact on how we improve the effectiveness or design of a visualization. So these first laws right here, proximity, similarity, closure, and down the line, describe how we sort of arrange and group together elements in space. So for example, the, the law of proximity says that marks on a page that are grouped close together tend to be interpreted as though they are part of the same group, right? And that's, that seems organic, that seems natural. We would intuitively expect that. The law of similarity says that marks on a page that appear visually similar in terms of their style, the visual style, tend to be grouped together. So here before, right, we had these, these separate groupings right here that were determined by relative proximity of items. Here we have different groupings that are determined by visual style. So perhaps this first row would be grouped together, second row grouped together, third adding a different color, fourth we have some texture, difference in size, and difference in geometry. Right? So we have these different kinds of groupings that become intuitive just based on using these different kinds of visual styles. The law of closure says that interrupted geometries become closed in perception. So this is a classic optical illusion, right, where we have these uh, separate uh, individual geometry, geometries right here and the appearance of a triangle in the middle, even though the triangle isn't actually there. So this actually uh, uh, manifests in the way that we interpret charts and graphs. So for example, if you think about a line chart, a time series that has a break between it, we will naturally try and draw a line between those breaks, right? So this actually has implications for how we draw those kinds of charts. Figure grounds. So if you, you've probably seen this optical illusion before as well. Is it two people facing each other or a candlestick? So this is describing the relative relationship between um, what's the figure in sort of the, the canvas in which you're generating a, uh, a chart, and what's the ground. So the ground is the canvas itself. And improper relationship, improper hierarchy between those two can influence how we interpret or understand the chart ground. Continuity just says that things that are connected tend to be perceived as being grouped together, right? So even though these two lines intersect, they are two different visual, uh, visual styles, and so we interpret this as a single grouping and this as a single grouping. And then common faith just says that things that are moving in the same direction can be grouped together. We see that here with these, these curving lines. And then there are some other kinds of Gestalt laws that refer, refer more to how we sort of interpret a visualization experientially. 
So the law of isomorphic correspondence says that we will tend to interpret the visualization or any sort of visual figure based on past experience. So a good example of this is our association of green, the color green with positive values, and the color red with negative values. Right? I'm sure we've all encountered the charter graph where that's been flipped, right? So maybe positive values have been represented in red and green as negative values. And that's a little jarring for us because that's not what we expect. So that's what the isomorphic correspondence says, and that sort of explains that. And then the, the law of prognance says that we can best optimize sort of cognitive load um, by simplifying a visual presentation. So if we have a bar chart like this, maybe we have a bunch of categorical variables down here, right? And we're sort of representing the positive value of each of those variables. We can improve the effectiveness just by doing something as simple as sorting the bars in descending order, right? Ranking those values. So there, there are all these different ways that we can sort of improve the effectiveness or ease of interpreting a charter graph. So here are some examples where those um, are in practice and then where they can sometimes um, conflict with each other. So at the top here, this first grouping right here, we have two sets of points. These maybe represent particular data points. And we have two different geometries, square and circle. So we might group the circles together as one group, one class, and the squares together as one group or one class. In the second uh, se section right here, we've sort of broken that association, right? So now we have lines connecting those different geometries. So now we're not grouping by geometry, but rather by using this continuation, this line that indicates connection. And then in the final section right here, we've even broken that connection piece with enclosure, right? So maybe these groupings are important, but maybe what's important from an interpretive standpoint is these particular points, because maybe there's a connection there that's of interest and that isn't reflected in the data set itself. So some examples of some actual charts where this might actually um, be in play. Right? So here we have um, a scatter plot with two, time, two series. So we have some circle markers indicating one data class, one data set, and square markers indicating another. It can be a little difficult to sort of trace patterns or trends within these data sets. But if we do something like just draw some lines between them, right? So now we, it's apparent that we have two classes of data, or two data sets that we're comparing side by side. And then again, we use this enclosure right here to point out perhaps something interesting or important about these particular sets of points. So again, very basic things, but they can make a big difference. Another thing you can do to sort of enforce hierarchy in a charter graph is to think about typography. So a bunch of comments on these sticky notes about labeling, right, text labels. So those, those are important, right? They, they um, are present often in the charts and graphs that we use because scientific data is very text heavy in terms of its verbose description. So we can do simple things to enforce hierarchy by using text labels of different size, different color, different weights to guide the user's eyes through a visualization. So for example, in this slide, right, we have a few different examples of that hierarchy being enforced. We have our header typography, which is in a larger font size, larger than the rest, in a slightly different color, although it's probably hard to see in this projector. Then we have um, next level hierarchy right here, with a smaller text size. And then yet another level of hierarchy here with an indentation, right? Alignment of this grouping, and then a change in font color. So we can use these kinds of hierarchical enforcements, including size, typeface, weight, color, orientation, and direction, space, and alignment to improve the, the direction or order in which a user reads or charts or graphs. And again, these are things that we have intuitions about, right? We, we know when it seems pretty dumb that a particular visualization cannot seem to get the, the labels correct. Any questions about any of this regarding composition and hierarchy? <clears throat> so the next thing I want to talk about is color, which is another theme that was apparent across a lot of these sticky notes. So color is really important, right, especially in communicating scientific data, because color is often one of the most useful channels through which we can encode value, we can encode numeric data. So color serves many different purposes in any charter graph, right? So it, it serves the purpose of labeling and classifying. 
serves the purpose of measuring, so actually encoding visual, uh, values in the data sets. We use color to represent reality, and we also use color to, to decorate or enliven. So a good visualization keeps in mind all of these different roles and uses them effectively and uses color palettes effectively to really um, amplify the extent to which these can be achieved. So to talk about color, we need to, to discuss a little bit about the theory behind how color works and how it's organized. So generally speaking, we tend to work within a space where we are most familiar with three components of color, right? So we can think about color lightness, so the relative darkness or relative quantity of light or white in a color, so that's defined along this lightness axis. We have color hue, so this is the name of a color. We have the, the rainbow color palette right here, color spectrum. So hue would include things like red, blue, green, yellow, things like that. And then saturation, which indicates the level to which there is gray or black in a color, right? So if a color has 0% saturation, we don't have that hue anymore, right? We just sort of are at gray. And if a color has 100% saturation, that's where we get to sort of the, the basic red that we know, or the basic green, the, gray, the basic blue. So these three different axes define the ways that we describe and notate colors. And this is important because we're often creating charts and graphs on computers, right? And computers create colors based on these different axes, but computers also create colors through an RGB model, right? So defining colors as mixtures of red, green, and blue. So this works great for computers, but it does not work well for humans, because humans don't see an RGB, right? So this has implications for how we interpret color palettes, because we don't interpret what would appear to be uniform color steps in a computer in the same way that humans are interpret that. So the, the idea of uniformity in a color palette relates to the extent to which each step, each gradual change in color in a particular color palette or color ramp is equally stepped, right? So any two comparisons of color, of color differences, should be exactly the same no matter where you are along that palette. So this top example right here shows a uniform color palette, a monochromatic color palette will always be uniform, right? So any two compared points here, any steps, will be will represent an equal change in color. Compare and contrast that with the rainbow color palette, which is not a uniform color palette, right? It's not perceptually uniform. So what happens is, as we go from this blue to this red, right, we see these actual regions where it appears that the differences are not equally stepped. Right? So for example, right around here, there's a sudden uh, gradual change, a sudden gradation. And the same thing right here, right? This, this sudden gradation that seems to imply some sort of step or a sudden change in the color palette. So again, this is really important because sometimes we, we choose color palettes in our visualizations without realizing that they're not uniform. And when things are not uniform, that can influence how we interpret a chart or a graph, especially when we're encoding things with color. So the task typically, typically becomes how to choose a good color palette based on the constraints that are available at hand. And those constraints are often determined by the software that we're, we're working with or maybe with the medium that we're, we're printing in, right? So in general, a, a good color palette should do four things. It should bring unity, identity, consistency, and hierarchy to a visualization. Right, so this is really just to say that we should be consistent in how we use a color palette and be careful and mindful about the ways in which that color palette actually reflects changes in the data set itself. This is sometimes not as easy as it sounds. So to begin sort of this conversation of how we choose good color palettes that do these things, we have to start by talking about the different kinds of color palettes that we tend to work with and when some of them are better used in other situations. So we tend to work with three different kinds of color palettes, right? So these should look familiar. So sequential color palettes represents a one-directional, a unidirectional change in value, right? So in this example, we have a, a green color, color ramp going from dark green to light green. So the, the values that we might encode this color ramp um, increase or decrease in the sequ sequential order. We also tend to use diverging color ramps. 
So this is useful when encoding values that lie on either side or either pole of a middle section, a middle point. So for example, maybe this, this middle point right here represents a zero value. Maybe the green colors represent a positive value, the red colors indicate a negative value. So we often use diverging color palettes when creating key maps, for example. And then finally, the, the third kind of color palette we tend to use is qualitative. So this is where we have qualitative categorical data, maybe ordinal, maybe nominal. Um, we, we are primarily showing changes or differences in class data classes using different color themes. So knowing how to choose a good color palette means knowing what kind of color palette, sequential, divergent, and qualitative, to use to, uh, based on the kind of situation. And so this sort of interpretive layer is often our responsibility because when we're creating a charter graph with particular software, we are responsible for determining whether or not the default color palette that the software gives us is actually appropriate. Right? So I'm sure we've all had lots of examples where we've made charts in R or Excel or even Tableau, if you use Tableau, where the default color palette just does not make any sense. Right? And that's because the software is, is doing its best to apply a, a good color palette based on general principles, based on the kind of data you're working with. But it's not always good at sort of interpreting that from a human perspective. And again, we're all doing this interpretive process from a human perspective. So it's up to us to really take the initiative in choosing appropriate color schemes. And that means not reflexively just accepting the color palette that's, color palette that's given us um, on command. So there are some basic things we can do to choose a good color palette. So the first thing we can do is to use colors that are easy to dis distinguish, right? And this is something that I think one of you mentioned, and it was mentioned in some of these post-it notes. So if we're going to use color, we should be able to tell the difference between them, right? That seems like a pretty basic thing. But that doesn't always happen in charts and graphs. So here's an example of two color palettes where that's sort of intention. So this top one right here is a color ramp um, from green to yellow, encoding four different color values, four different data values, perhaps. And it's pretty easy to tell the difference between this color and this color and any combination of any pair of colors. If we take the exact same color palette from the top and interpolate it to 10 colors, right, it becomes much more difficult to tell the difference between these sort of internal comparisons right here. Right? You might be able to do comparisons on either end of the spectrum, but in the middle here, it's next to impossible to tell what those differences are. So using colors that are easy to distinguish can be enforced by just simply reducing the number of colors that you're using. Right? So typically using four to six different colors maximum is ideal. You really don't want to use more than 12 ever because at that point the cognitive load associated with trying to interpret differences becomes so high that you can't actually get anything useful out of it. So often in the sciences, it's difficult to only use four to six colors, right? Because we're working with very multi-dimensional data or lots of data classes. So if possible, if you have to use like 12 different colors, try to find ways to transform your data sets to group things together, right? Because once you group things and classify things into larger clusters, then you can use fewer colors and improve the um, extent to which those colors can be easily interpreted. So using colors that are easy to distinguish is a pretty basic thing we can do to improve a color palette. Another thing that we can do is to use colors that are accessible. And I mean this both from the perspective of people who have color blindness or color sensitivities and people who don't have any color correction issues. So even as, as human beings with, with no color deficiencies whatsoever, um, we can have difficulty interpreting specific kinds of color palettes. So when it comes to color blindness, Right, I'm sure we've all seen situations like this where we have a, a selected color palette right here and it's great to anyone without any color blindness um, or, other, or other color deficiencies. And then you have someone who does have color blindness try and read that and you wash out right, so many of these differences of data classes. Right? So here before where we were able to sort of distinguish these different uh, data classes and subclasses, here it becomes much more difficult to do that because everything just sort of looks kind of yellow, yellowish, greenish. And then in monochrome, you lose all of that completely, so you cannot make any comparisons whatsoever. Right? Here's another example, a good example and a bad example of color 
uh, to a blind friendly palette. So this top one right here is an example of an original color palette. So the top um, heaven up here is for people who don't have color blind, that's what it looks like originally. The, the bottom panel right here shows what it looks like to those who do have color blindness. So again, if you're using something like this to represent, represent a divergent color palette, maybe divergent color uh, numerical values, right, someone with color blindness is not going to be able to interpret that, right, because it looks exactly the same on either end of the colors. Here's an example of a better color palette that accounts for that. So here we have the original color palette, and then down here is what it looks like to someone with color blindness or color deficiencies. So you can still sort of retain the divergent color palette and show differences with respect to those colors. So that's, this is true of people with color blindness, right? So we have to think about these um, deficiencies and how people interpret our charts and graphs. But we run into trouble too, even if we don't have color blindness whatsoever. So here's an example. This is actually one of my favorite examples of visualizations to show in any of these kinds of workshops. So this is a, a four plus map of the United States. And I intentionally left out color key down here. And if I were to show you this map, and you, you were to just look at it as, in a split second, what kinds of conclusions or conclusion might you draw immediately from this map? Yeah, right? So it seems like there is a big divide right here in the middle of the country. So if we look at the key, we find something surprising, which is each step in color here encodes the same step in numerical value. So when we get down to this, this border between green and yellow, right, so this transition between the greens and the yellows, that step from green to yellow represents the exact same numerical step as the step between these two greens. And so there's this perceptual illusion here that there is a break right down the middle of the country. So I'm sure you've all heard that rainbow color palettes are evil, right? You should never use them. And this is why, because <laughs> human beings do not interpret it uniformly. Right? There's something actually very special about the color yellow. Human beings are very sensitive to the color yellow, so whenever we see it, it pops out because we are very sensitive to it. So that's why the rainbow color palette doesn't look uniform, and that's why we should never use it to encode data like this. So using colors that are accessible is, is an important thing. Um, and the basic way you can enforce this is to really emphasize and use colors that provide strong visual contrast. Right? So ideally this includes selecting colors that vary mainly in brightness and not so much in hue. We are actually tend to be best at interpreting differences in brightness, especially when the steps between those different levels are quite big. So that's sort of a basic way that you can um, really increase the accessibility of a color palette. And then ultimately, when appropriate, don't use colors at all, right? If you can find a way to encode a data set or a numerical value um, in a way that doesn't include color, that's maybe best because you're not always, you don't always have control over how someone might be trying to read that particular chart or graph. If they have color blindness, or maybe they have to print it out in black and white, right? And then if you encoding things in color, then you lose those numeric encodings altogether. You can also make a good color palette by choosing colors that are semantically relevant. So this can mean a variety of things. This can include, for example, thinking about the isom isomorphic correspondence idea that we talked about earlier, right? So using colors that match what, to, what we expect them to represent. So for example, green colors representing positive values and red colors representing negative values. But this also means using colors that are semantically relevant in the sense that they, they match the nature of your data, right? So if you're working with qualitative data, then you should really use color schemes that only show contrast between classes and not order of magnitude. So this is actually a, a big thing, a big problem that I see people, people do, a big error people make often. If I were to show you, for example, these color palettes right here, so this is a, a qualitative color palette, um, a few different versions of that. So we have different hues, right, so representing different classes, perhaps, of data. But each hue has multiple um, levels of, of magnitude, levels of saturation, right? So we have two blues here, two oranges, two greens, two reds. Here we have four purples, 
four greenish yellows, and here four blues, four oranges, right? So if we're working with a color palette like these, right, we have to be very careful that if we are encoding data that is categorical in nature, whether that's ordinal or nominal, right, uh, qualitative categorical data, then we should not be using differences in saturation to represent differences in those data classes. Because when we see colors grouped like this together in a charter graph, we will want to group them together. We will want to order these things according to the relative saturation or lightness of those colors, right? So again, something we don't always think about, but it's important to think about because this simple thing can have major implications for how someone reads your charter graph. We also need to make sure that we use colors that minimize perceptual interactions. So the, the example of the, the rainbow color ramp, um, that's a really good example of color interaction. There are some interesting optical illusions that result from colors that actually make a surprising number of appearances in the kinds of charts and graphs that we tend to make in the sciences in particular. So two of them in particular are, are very important for us. So one of them is simultaneous contrast. So you may have seen this before. In the background here, we have this gradient from this blue to this sort of magenta-ish color, and then this bar in the middle. And perceptually, it seems as though the bar in the middle changes color at the same time that the outside gradient does. But the reality is that this bar is the same color all the way through, right? So this, this background gradient is sort of enforcing this perceptual interaction that makes us think that the inside is changing color or not. Down here, we have a similar situation where this, this inner gray square might appear lighter or darker, depending on the, the outside in hue, the outside in lightness, and saturation, the color around it. And then contrast of hue, sort of a similar effect, except now we're looking at size differences enforced by relative contrast of actual colors. So this, this inner square right here can appear larger or smaller depending on the hue and the lightness of that square in contrast with the, the color that surrounds it. So these are actually pretty important in things like heat maps. We use heat maps often, right? And we may not always be aware that uh, these things occur in the heat maps that we create. So here's an example of a heat map that has a bad color ramp, right? right? A bad color palette. So what's what's bad about this heat map? to one side. And the, the result of that is that we overemphasize a lot of these brighter orange points. Right? Here's an example of a, a better heat map. Although I would argue that this is not ideal either. Anyone have any arguments for why it's not ideal? The scale. Is it's difficult to interpret that range. Yeah. So contrast this with something like this. So essentially all we've done is change the, the middle point of that color ramp in this heat map, which is black here, to white here. So what do you think, so sometimes we make heat maps that look like either one of these, right? Sometimes we have white as that middle point, sometimes we have black as that middle point. Can you think of any situations where you might want to use white or black as a contrasting color? Yeah. which you're working. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. 
I would also argue that, right, the, the difference... So I mentioned earlier that humans are really good at seeing differences in lightness, right? So in this example, since we have white as sort of the middle of that divergent color palette, it's easier to tell where those values right around that white are, so you can see the differences in lightness better. So maybe a, a white as a center color point is better when you want to make very visible the values immediately surrounding that white, surrounding the center point. And maybe you use black as a contrasting color point when you want the poles to be most visible, right? Because when you have black as a contrasting point, right, the, the really bright red and the really bright green are easier to see as opposed to the, sort of the lower saturation reds and greens that are immediately around that. So this will often depend on your particular use case and what you want to achieve, what your objective is. Something to think about the next time that you make a heat map and the default is one of these color palettes. Think about why one of these might be better versus the other. And then one more thing about heat maps. This is one of my favorite things, actually. So this is an example from, um, from the Points of View articles. So this is a, a subset of a heat map. Okay. And there are two cells that can have asterisks right, asterisks right here. So those are actually the exact same color, They're the exact same value. But it doesn't look like it, right? It sort of looks like, at least from here, that this cell is darker, this cell is lighter. But they represent the exact same value. So this is an example of the simultaneous contrast actually having real consequences for how we interpret the visualization. Right? So again, Color things are, are really, really important, especially when it comes to, to heat maps. What's that? I'm sorry for interrupting. I, I just sort of a sense of frustration. Is it? Can you find a better way, or, or do we have an idea of what would be a better way of showing that data, or to advance to anything in this article? I don't think that there's any real way to get around this, especially in a heat map, which is designed in this particular way. So what you might be able to do is use this in conjunction with the other charts and graphs that can pull out those particular data points and make that comparison more apparent, or show a bunch of heat maps with different color palettes. Yeah. You can supervise the two together. What's that? You can supervise the two together. Yeah. So it, again, the strategy will depend on what exactly you want to accomplish, right? So inevitably, it's probably often going to be the case that any charter graph that we make will have some sort of perceptual bias that's built into it, just based on the way that we interpret all these different visual features in combination. And you should be careful that you're sort of optimizing a, a visualization based on the particular message you want to communicate, the particular data point you want to communicate. Okay. Yeah. Well, we should all be very critical of visualizations in general, um, but especially so in the sciences, I think. Any questions about color that we talked about? Okay. The next thing I want to talk about is, is figure clarity. So again, another common theme that appeared across all these post-it notes. So clarity refers to the, the extent to which a figure is cluttered, for example, so that word was actually used. It refers to the legibility of, of a visualization, right? How easy it is to actually read a visualization. And this is surprisingly difficult to achieve sometimes, especially when we're working within software defaults that don't always have clarity um, prioritized in mind. So before we talk about figure clarity, we need to talk about some of the, the vocabulary around how we describe or characterize a visualization. So any visualization is built up from three basic attributes, three, three, three basic elements, excuse me. So the first is marks. So these are the, the visual graphical primitives that make up a chart or graph, such as a point or a line, I'll show you some examples. Then we have channels, which are ways to control the visual appearance or style of marks. And then we have attributes, which are dimensions of data. So these are the, the things that we are encoding through our marks and through our channels. So there are, there's just a handful of basic kinds of marks that we tend to work with, right? So we work with points, for example, on the scatter plots, lines, and the line chart in the time series. 
different areas, encoding geometries. Containment is also another kind of mark. So we saw this example um, in some charts earlier. And then links, links between points, is another kind of mark. So these, are, again, are the, the basic graphical primitives that we use to construct a charter graph. And then we use channels to encode particular attributes through those marks. Right? So these, these are things we all work with. So for example, color, changing the color of marks. Same, same thing with value and gradation, texture, symbol, sequence, size and scale, proximity and density, area, length, proportion, count. Right? So these are all the basic kinds of things that we see in bar charts, in scatter plots, and line charts, and histograms. Right? So these are all those channels in action in those basic kinds of charts and graphs. So if we were to define these examples, these example charts, sort of in that language, right? So here, in this, in this chart, our marks are circles, they're points, right? And the, the channels are position. So here, we're encoding attributes based on the x and y position of these marks. In this example, our, our marks are essentially lines, they're just sort of thick lines, like that way. And we're encoding value based on position on the x-axis, as well as length on the vertical axis. Right? So now we have not only the horizontal position of the bar, but also the, the length of the bar. And then in this example, again, here we have um, sort of points, we have actual geometries, we have circles in our marks, and we are encoding through two different ways, actually three different ways, encoding values. First is by position, x and y position in circles. Second is by color, so we have this blue and this green color, and then third is by size. Right. So we're often combining all these different kinds of channels together in a single chart. And since we are so accustomed to doing this, we have to be careful because sometimes we can overload a charter graph if we don't use these kinds of encodings um, effectively or appropriately. So a, a good sort of basic principle to think about what this looks like in practice comes from Edward Tufte. So has anyone heard of Edward Tufte? Some of you? Yeah. So Edward Tufte is a very important person in the field of information design and visualization. Um, he's written a bunch of books that are sort of foundational to the field, including Visual Display of Quantitative Information, classic in the field if you're interested. And Tufte talks about sort of his guidelines on graphical integrity, like what a graph or chart should be doing when it's representing or communicating a data set. And one of those guidelines, and the most important is, above all else, show the data. So when we're creating a charter graph, what we want to be doing is actually communicating the data. That's what the charter graph is there for. And in order to do that effectively, we have to think about the, the extent to which we're using all the marks and channels available to us effectively. So he defines this thing called the data ink ratio, which is essentially the, the amount of ink in the charter graph used to communicate data or encode data, actual data values, divided by the, the total ink used to print the graphic. So this is sort of an, his approximation of saying, how faithful is a charter graph to communicating the data, faithful to that task of communicating data? Because if it has a lot of extra adornments, extra decorations around it, then it's not really fulfilling that responsibility. So here's an example of something with very low data ink ratio. Right, this is sort of ridiculous. Right, so here's an infographic showing statistics about fantasy sports players. And the, I guess the, the data that's being encoded here is really only shown by these values, these printed values, and the relative size of these triangles. Although it's not, it's not actually as good coding whatsoever. But there's all this extra ink around it, right? There's all these extra decorations, all these extra labels that don't really contribute anything useful whatsoever to this, this particular visualization. So Tufti would say this has a very low data ink ratio. Now, contrast that with something that has a very high data ink ratio, like this. Right, so here we have, I think these are, I'm not sure what these are. <laughs> they might be cars or something. Um, but it's, it's a lot of data, right? So we have so much stuff encoded here that even though all the ink used to print this graphic represents data, it's impossible to read because it's so complex. So the point here is that we can use the data ink ratio as sort of a good guideline for thinking about how to improve a visualization, 
but it's not all the be all end all of what makes a good charter graph, right? It doesn't do, it's not, it's incomplete in explaining what makes an effective visualization. So typically, when we are thinking about how to improve the relative data ink ratio of a charter graph, what we're really doing is thinking about how do we fight against the software defaults that are given to us. So again, this is a, this is a theme that we're coming back to over and over again, sort of working with and against the software that thinks it's no, thinks it, things that knows what's, be what's best for a charter graph. So we often need to really critically assess a charter graph, like the basic charter graph that a software gives us, in order to figure out how to improve it. So I have some examples from R, from ggplot specifically, of where this might work in practice. So here's an example of a bar chart, a basic bar chart. Right? And this is sort of without any extra directions given software telling us how to um, improve the visual appearance. And there are a few different things that are sort of wrong with this, right? So we have la uh, labels that are overlapping, and we can't really read these, but they're pretty basic, important things. And then we also have sort of these unnecessary extra grid lines that aren't really serving any purpose. So there's these white grid lines, and we have this gray background. So again, those aren't really necessary, and we can sort of remove those from our charts and make them easier to read. Yeah. So you could do that for the horizontal grid lines. I'm not sure that the vertical grid lines do anything to really aid interpretation of the charts. Yeah. So this would, again, this will depend on your particular use case. Like there's some situations where I use grid lines as well, um, and those are situations in which, for example, I'm working with a very long y-axis and significant differences in lengths of bars, and so it's easier to sort of uh, highlight particular points in that axis to make it easier to, to follow that. But in general, you don't really often need grid lines, especially not as many as a software default might want to give you, right? So lots of times you create a charter graph that gives you tick lines and grid lines that are just all over the place. It's like you don't need that many. Here's another example looking at the same kinds of things with a scatter plot. So this is actually an interesting example because here we have what ggplot gives us, right, with the scatter plot, and again, we see um, this, these grid lines and this gray background, which may not be necessary. And then here's an R-based plot, which I would argue is actually better. And the reason I would argue that is because, well, first of all, we don't have unnecessary grid lines. I just hate grid lines, as you can tell. Yeah. Um, second of all, we don't have that gray background unnecessary there, too. Third of all is the choice of circle marker, I think, is better than this one. And the reason is that our data set is fairly dense in the middle here. So in areas of high density, it can be hard to distinguish individual points. But here in this example, since we have open markers, it's a little easier to tell where those particular points are overlapping and actually analyze individual points one by one. Okay. And then here's just sort of a, a basic example of a line chart from ggplot, and the, the color I, I think is fine, but again, you, don't, you can't read any of the access labels down here, and there are so many grid lines, right? There's a grid line for every single tick here. That's ridiculous. So again, these are the kinds of things that software might give you by default and you have to do some of the work of cleaning those up. So there are some basic ways that we can simplify um, a charter graph to in increase its clarity, right? So we can, at, at the basic level, reduce the number of elements, right? Fewer elements in a charter graph means easier to read, easier to interpret. We can also use Gestalt principles, so all those principles of perceptual organization, like similarity, proximity, to improve the, um, the extent to which we can accurately interpret a complex charter graph. And then the third thing is to really use strong visual encodings. So this is actually something that we often have the most control over, this idea of using strong contrasting encodings. Because when we have high contrast in our visual encodings, we increase the salience of those differences between those individual points. So I have some examples of what those look like through different channels. So here's a sequence, right, where instances of A are easy to find, instances of P are not so easy to find, right? And that's just because we've highlighted the A's here with this, this bold 
red color, so it's, it pops out very quickly. So maybe you're in a situation where you need to show sequence and there are particular points that you need to highlight, right? Using color is a really easy, effective, simple way of bringing out the salience of those things. Here's a more complex chart where there are a bunch of things sort of in conflict, in contradiction with each other. So this is, so there are a few different things going on in sort of this first original example right here, right? So we're, we're encoding three different things. So we're encoding cluster by shape, by geometry. We're encoding mutation by color. And we're encoding quantity by relative weight of a marker. So, who thinks this is not a good way of encoding these different values and why? Yeah. Yeah, so it's hard to distinguish those weight differences, especially when points are close to each other. What about if so what, what channel do you see first? Is it color? Because that's what I see first. So the reason I ask that is because if color is one of the first things that we see, right, that color should be encoding something that makes sense. And in this case, I don't think color, especially this particular color map right here, is a useful way of encoding these differences. I think color is better used to represent which is done here, right? So if we take a step back from the second chart right here, when we see these movements of colors, it makes more sense to think of those as individual color uh, clusters. And then in this example, within those different clusters, those different clusters of colors, we're using this sort of dot notation that indicates the presence or absence of mutation. And then in this example, they've done something similar, except now what they want to do is really highlight the difference, difference in mutation. And they're doing that by no orientation, right? So vertical, vertical example. So these kinds of channels that we tend to use in charts and graphs, right? We can use them in combination with each other, but we need to be very intentional about which channels we're using for what purpose. And again, that's going to depend entirely on what we want to achieve, right? So maybe, maybe in this example, the what we want people to see first is the the clusters, right? Encoding with color. And maybe in this example, what we want to see is the differences in mutations, because the difference in orientation is very easy to see. So someone brought up the point about overlapping markers, right? So this is actually another very simple, well, deceptively simple um, thing that we can improve in any single visualization. So the interesting thing about the typical kinds of geometry, geometries that we use in any chart of graph is that there's only one geometry that doesn't reproduce itself when you overlap them, right? And that's, that's the open circle. So if you have multiple circles overlapping each other, you don't get more circles on the inside, which is different from overlapping triangles, right? So we have these triangles that are here, and we have overlapping triangles, squares and crosshairs, right? So one in doubt, if possible, it's best to use open circle markers and not closed markers. Because again, if you use closed sort of filled markers, you lose the ability to distinguish points in a cluster. Related to that, we can use markers that have strong visual boundaries. So this top row right here, right? So these are these are collections of geometries of mark types that are very easily distinguished, right? And it's because they have strong visual boundaries. You can tell the difference between a circle and a crosshair, and between that and a square, and a circle with light or, or heavy weight and color things like that. As opposed to this selection right here, which is weak visual boundaries, right? So if we have triangles in different orientations, it's really difficult to tell the difference between those things, right? So if we have our triangles in one direction versus triangles in another direction, up or down, and we have all those overlapping on each other, we're not going to be able to tell the difference between them, right? The same thing is true with things like diamonds and squares, pentagons, things like that. So we can sort of combine these different kinds of um, markers with different uh, degrees of visual boundaries in these examples down here. Right? So sort of this combination of 
of Marx was very strong visual boundaries. Here we're using color, again, to impose strong boundaries. Here we're using um, the same kind of geometry, but now weights and sort of internal markers. And then we can even use um, textured markers for very dense data. So when we're using these kinds of collections of markers, um, and we're thinking about collections that have strong um, visual boundaries, we have to be careful because sometimes we can use them without actually encoding natural hierarchies in the data, right? So in this example, we're using both color, so we're using color, and we're using geometry, and we're using enclosure to indicate these different combinations of variables, right? And the, the color choice here isn't really intuitive, right? It's sort of questionable why that's an effective use of that type of encoding. And then in B and C here, we have alternative options to encoding the exact same data sets using markers that have strong visual boundaries and that actually encode natural hierarchies in the data sets. And so things that we can think about as we're creating charts and graphs that involve very high dimensional data sets. Text labels, right? So another easy thing we can improve to increase the, the clarity of any figure. So something as simple as improving label placements can go a long way in your target graph, right? So in this, this example, it's unclear or ambiguous what labels correspond with, with which points. We improve that here, some spacing and uniform arrangements of those particular labels. And then if we're working with things like figures, where we have lots of labels to indicate particular regions in the figure, right? We can do something as simple as align all the labels that we do use um, to the same reference points. So in this top one right here, right, we have all these different labels with lines, call out lines in different directions, mm -hmm. sort of aligned at different places along the figure. And then the second one right here, we've improved that by you know, uh, making a form the alignment of these labels on the left-hand side here, and the right-hand side do the same thing, do these blue lines, sending that, that form of alignment, and then using only horizontal lines to sort of help clean up the, the overall arrangement and organization of the figure. Any questions about this? So we've talked about composition, hierarchy, we've talked about color, we've talked about clarity, and the last thing I want to talk about is working with multidimensional data. So thinking about the dimensionality that we're expressing in the charter graph and making sure that we are expressing that appropriately or in a way that really aids communication and interpretation. So we are often working with, with multiple dimensions of data simultaneously, right? And when we work with multiple dimensions, the complexity of any figure naturally increases. So we can think about sort of this, this progression through these series of panels right here, where maybe in this particular visualization, right, we have one dimension that we're encoding in horizontal position. In the second one right here, now we're up to sort of a scatter plot where we're representing two dimensions, horizontal and vertical position. Now we're at three dimensions, we're adding our color on top of that. Four dimensions, we have color and size. And then five dimensions, right, we have color, size, and marker type. All right, so we can see how this can get very complex very, very quickly. And we see this kind of situation quite often in the charts and graphs that we make. So when we're creating these charts and graphs, we can really think about what it means to use some basic elements of storytelling, data storytelling, to improve the extent to which a user can interpret those charts and graphs. So these are the kinds of things, right, that we do in any sort of storytelling process, right? We have an introduction, we have a question, we have conflict, build-up, resolution. And these, these are actually practical guidelines, a, a practical framing for thinking about how we create any visualization, because ultimately, right, what we're doing is communicating some sort of narrative about the data sets, right? We don't do it in the exact same terms, but we can sort of leverage some of the basic design principles that come with that. So here's an example of sort of that storytelling in action with the multidimensional data sets around um, cancer and smoking, right? So here what they've done is create a series of panels where each panel represents a different visualization, and each visualization is a different slice of the data set, 
right? So they're not trying to combine all these different slices and dimensions in the same single visualization. We're breaking those out slice by slice, one by one, and arranging those in a way such that the user can understand the sequence of those visualizations and understand the, the point that you're trying to communicate through those. So we can think about what this looks like when we're creating charts and graphs in the natural sciences by considering different strategies for representing multidimensional data in two dimensions, right? Because we're, we're almost always limited to working in a two-dimensional space. So we always have to think about how to best leverage the, the constraints that come with that. So there are four big ways, four big strategies that we can follow to um, really improve the interpretation of multidimensional data in two dimensions. So the first is small multiples. So you've probably seen something like this before, right? So this is um, a data set that is a collection of different line charts, different time series, and they all share the same horizontal axis, right? Horizontal being time, but each panel represents a particular slice of the data set, right? And so something like this facilitates comparisons not only within each data set, but also across the data sets. So we have this shared axis across all of them. So small multiples is a very easy way of improve, improving the extent to which a highly dimensional data set can be interpreted. Another thing you can do is to utilize a, a practice in information design called context and focus. So in this example, we have a scatter plot encoding some data sets where we see the entire data set at large, right? We see the overall trend of the data set. And then we also have this, this call out right here, this highlighted section, where we can zoom in on a particular region of interest. Right, so this is this is what we call context and focus. The context being the large data set being visible as a whole, and then the focus being a particular sub-region that we want to emphasize um, and pull something important out of that. So you can incorporate this kind of strategy easily in the charts and graphs that you make. Right, if you're working with a very complex scatter plot or very complex time series, you may have done this before, where you show the entire time series and then you zoom in on a particular region of interest. We can also use filtering and faceting to improve the readability of multidimensional data. So there are a few different ways you can do this um, in terms of arranging different kinds of charts and graphs or using particular conventions of charts and graphs. So for example, parallel coordinate plots. You've probably seen this. Um, this is a classic example showing, um, I think it's the iris data set in R, right? Pretty common example. So the parallel coordinate plot, um, if you haven't seen this before, what we do is we have multiple dimensions in which we're encoding or representing a variable. And those dimensions are represented as vertical axes, right? So each path across all those axes represents a single data point, maybe a single record in your data set. So it's, it's useful for sort of visually clustering groups of, of data points when there are multiple dimensions of data that you're trying to encode simultaneously. Another thing you can do is to use scatter plot matrices. So we're often creating scatter plots in particular, right? So when we're trying to show all the different combinations of variables across multiple scatter plots, instead of showing them one by one, we can create a simple matrix, right? So we can do all those cross comparisons quite easily. So in this scatter plot right here, we're kind of comparing simple length versus simple width. Here we have simple width versus puddle length. Here we have simple width versus puddle width. Right. So it's sort of this easy, effective way of visually arranging multiple scatter plots in a matrix to make, again, those comparisons within a data set as well as across data sets much more apparent. Sort of a, a sister approach to this is using trellis displays. So a trellis display is a general term for any display in which we are fasting out multiple levels of dimensions in sort of a grid-like structure to facilitate comparison within and across them. Right, so here we have the original data set right here. Um, I believe this is showing uh, voter trends by party um, geographically and by age. So the original data set right here, and then in this trellis display right here, we have broken out by party affiliation, by gender identity, by region, and by age. So we're using sort of this, this trellis, trellis layout to um, improve the the ability to do all those kinds of co comparisons simultaneously within and across different categories. And then another thing we can do is use multi-form encoding. 
right? So this is just a, a fancy way of saying represent the same data sets in multiple ways, in multiple visual styles. And this is useful because often different visual styles will facilitate different kinds of analysis, right? So if we have a scatter plot that looks like this, or any kind of data set that looks like this, using circle markers, here we connect them by lines, and that might show trends, temporal trends in the data sets. And then here we encode the exact same data sets using bars. And the difference here is that while we might be comparing trends in this encoding right here, here it's easy to do a comparison of actual value, right? We can compare the length of the bars. So multi-form encoding really just means thinking about what com kind of comparison or analysis you want to achieve, and then choosing the, the best kind of encoding to achieve that. And then we can also use multi-form multi encoding as a way of thinking about aggregation in a data sets. So again, often working with high dimensional data, we, we want to sort of collapse our data sets into aggregates and make that um, more, digest more digestible for our readers and users to interpret. So here's an example that looks like um, a variety of encodings through aggregation. So here we have the original data sets, this collection of numbers. In the panel B here, we are binning those data points in these bins right here and encoding those bins by circle size. Here we're doing another kind of binning, do a Instagram like style, and it's along the number line. And then in this final version right here, we're taking that exact same binning from C, formulated from B, and then encoding that into the bar charts. And then maybe adding in a reference line and an asterisk for significance. Right? So again, the exact same data sets all the way through, the different kinds of visual encodings to um, enable different kinds of comparisons or analyses. So these, again, are just very basic things that we encounter often in charts and graphs, um, but they have big consequences for how we interpret these things. Right? So composition, color, clarity, and dimensionality, um, these are things that, again, our software will think they know the best what's for us, um, but it's up to us to sort of add that human layer of interpretation and design um, critique to really improve the charts and graphs that are given to us. Any questions about any of the things that I talk about, talked about in the past, in these past slides? Yeah. Speaking, if you don't know what you're doing, you should be using one font. Yeah. Okay. And if you're going to vary anything to enforce uh, hierarchy, typographic hierarchy, you should really focus on font size and font weight and font color, and nothing else. Sometimes people get into trouble, troubled water with, for example, combining different font styles, like sans serif font versus serif fonts. If you don't know why you're doing that, that can actually be very jarring visually. Um, so, generally speaking, if you're going to use typography to clean up a chart graph or to enforce hierarchy, really limit yourself to again those things of one font and then emphasizing differences in, in size, color, and weight, and nothing beyond that. So in the next hour, um, we're going to spend some time doing some critiques. So this is going to build on the, some of the stuff that we started with at 3.30, where I had you look up examples of good and bad visualizations, and then write up your, your thoughts on what um, made those good or bad. Um, before we do that, I'll give you about five minutes break.